Thank you, Brother Gibbon. I think uh, it's all right. I'll just stand down here. And uh, let me tell you something that happened about uh, 10 years ago. The late Don DeWelt was scheduled to have a preaching tour in India, and his health had been failing and had heart trouble. He recently diagnosed with diabetes and a lot of other physical problems. He talked about his body in scriptural terms. He said it's a body of humiliation. <laughs> um, at any rate, uh, he needed someone to go with him and carry his handbags, and I became his attendant, like John Mark was. I said, don't go by Perkins and Pamphylia, I may go back. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, it was a real uh, honor to me to be with Don. And uh, we went to Madras and stayed in the home of a man by the name of Nyanis Economy, who had an earned PhD from the university in Madras, a brilliant individual. And we went out into the country to minister, witness, preach Christ in those remote villages. It was about 10 o'clock one night when we began a service miles away. I'm not even sure where it was. We were near the border of another state, Andhra Pradesh. I don't know where we were, but we were back in there, and I saw for the first time what apparently was demon possession. I read about it in the Bible, and uh, you have in your own mind, you know, the Bible talks about a demon carrying somebody, and you imagine in your mind what it was like. Well, that's what I saw. I don't know that the demon that I'm not an expert in that at all. I'm just telling you that I saw something I could not explain. We went about a half mile way back up in the field where there was irrigation water for a baptismal service, and by now it was midnight. A young man, 15, 16 years old, was to be baptized in Christ. And before he made his good confession in the baptismal waters, something began tearing him. And the brethren began to sing. Now, time, nobody had to watch but us Westerners. Time is a little well. They have all night prayer meetings over there on a regular basis. Remember Wesley Stepp telling the story of an American evangelist going to India and telling everybody to pray 15 minutes a day. Every, every person I read 15 minutes a day and the translator stopped talking and he said, tell them what I said. And he said, sir, they're already praying three hours a day, now what do you want me to say? <laughs> so, uh, at any rate, here these people are and they're singing and this same song, I can't understand a word of it, but it's over and over and over and over and over, the same song. I said, what? Are they singing? And I was told they're singing about the blood of Jesus. <laughs> yes. And I saw that young man calm down and was baptized into Christ and went on his way rejoicing. Well, we were about three miles from the camp. They call a camp an ashram. And all the way back to the camp, I was singing a song, or it was going over in my mind, <clears throat> and I want you to sing it with me if you know it's the blood of Jesus. The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. Yeah. 
You and I set standards for ourselves that we don't keep. I'm going to jog this year. I'm going to lose so much weight this year. I'm going to read the Bible through this year. I'm going to pray more this year. We set a standard in our own mind. We don't even live up to that. And that's one of the reasons why we are condemned is because our own conscience condemns us. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a conscience. Timothy McVeigh is apparently uh, the guy who blew up this federal building in Oklahoma City. Someone asked him, I understand, what he thought about all those little children dying and it bothered him. He's got a conscience. Mm -hmm. Susan Smith is admitted to murdering her two children. And uh, she needs the Lord. I feel sorry for her. she got a problem with this conscience. No matter what they do, she's supposed to have been suicidal, and now here she is fighting the death penalty. I don't understand that. I mean, if you're very suicidal, it's like you're welcome. You know, you say, well, this is what I want. But at any rate, uh, can, you, can you imagine what it would be like for her to live, she will live the rest of her life with this thing of conscience? feeding away, unless her conscience becomes defiled or seared with a hot iron. Yeah. In which case, she can sin with impunity and become like an animal made to be taken and destroyed. Animals don't have a conscience. You can yeah. teach a gorilla to detonate a bomb, and he doesn't worry about how many children are killed. Uh, you can teach a chimpanzee to strike a match and they'll burn down an orphanage and never have a pain or twinge of conscience because of their animals. And as you know, the Bible talks about some people who are reduced to the level of animals. They have no conscience, been seared with a hot iron. They're beyond the realm of redemption. It's impossible to renew them again into repentance. It's a sin unto death. And uh, they're made to be taken and destroyed. In Albert Henry Newman's church history, which I studied in college many years ago, uh, he described Nero as a young man. He was gifted in poetry, music, he was genial, he was humane. At the beginning of his reign, he awakened high expectations. Augustus had esteemed it a personal affliction to be obliged to punish, and when he gave the death penalty for the first time he regretted that he had ever learned to write. The youthful Nero, after some time, rejoiced that in his entire empire not one drop of blood had been shed. Uh, under his tuition, such philosophers and statesmen as Seneca and Burrus, it was expected that the ingenious youth would become a paragon of wisdom and of justice. Seneca thought him incapable of learning cruelty and expected the emperor's gentleness of disposition to permeate the entire empire and transform the world into the innocent golden age of mankind. You know that Nero became one of the most degraded monsters who ever lived. He ordered the murder of his brother, the assassination of his mother, the murder of his first wife. His second wife died from personal abuse. He greedily sought the praise of his people. Uh, he played the part of a public buffoon, performing in public under, uh, as a, in disguise. He became involved in, in unbridled indulgence of every kind, and this is the way that the historian Tacitus described his persecution of the Christians. First, they were arraigned. First uh, were arraigned those who confessed. Then, on their information, a vast multitude was convicted. Not so much on the charge of arson. It is thought that Nero burned down the city of Rome so that he could rebuild it on the magnificent scale of Constantinople. And then, to blame somebody for it, he blamed the Christians. So the Christians were arraigned, and then they were confessed, and they were to uh, inform on other Christians. And they were convicted, said Tacitus, not so much on the charge of arson as for their hatred of the human race. Their deaths were made more cruel by the mockery that accompanied them. Some were covered with the skins of wild beasts and torn to pieces by dogs. Others perished on the cross or in the flames, and others again were burnt after sunset as torches to light the darkness. Nero himself granted his gardens for the show and gave exhibitions in the circus and dressed as a charioteer, mixed with the people, or drove his chariot himself. Thus guilty and deserving of punishment as they were, half of us thought the Christians should die. Uh, it seems they were to be pitied, 
uh, as they were put to death, not for the benefit of the state, but to gratify the cruelty of one individual. So here's a man, as a young man, who was thought incapable of learning cruelty who becomes one of the most degraded monsters on earth, and a historian says, you know, he put these Christians to death, but the battle was not at all for the benefit of the state, but just to satisfy his own sadistic pleasure. Now, Brother Wilson uh, is here, and uh, I still remember Seth's lecture on the alarm clock, that uh, you say, I'm going to get up at Set your time, 6 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock, whatever. We set the alarm. We're going to get up. Now, if you don't get up, you're doing some damage to something very vital to your spiritual makeup. And yet, you can come to the place where, you know, you have to set the alarm in the dishpan. The alarm go off this morning, but I don't know. I didn't hear it. But we need a louder alarm. And you can come to the place where you just deaden your sensibility. The alarm goes off, but you don't hear it because you have trained yourself. You have done something irreparable to a mechanism of a warning device, like a conscience. That's why the scriptures are so very forceful about not doing anything that will damage your conscience. There's nothing Amen. wrong with eating meat offered under the alarm. There really is. Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. There is nothing wrong with eating meat offered unto idols, but if you think there's something wrong, yes. you better not do it. Whatsoever Amen. is not of faith is, is sin. It does irreparable damage to you. You can't be a Christian without a conscience. Your conscience is something which causes you to reach out for God and want to be saved. But if you think you're all right, if you think you haven't done anything wrong, if you never hear the alarm, then you're beyond the scope and reach of salvation. Mm -hmm. One man believes that he may eat all things. In other words, we eat third. One man esteems one day above another. Another man esteems every day alike. It doesn't really matter as long as you do not violate your own conscience. The moment you start violating your conscience, you're doing damage to something that is essential to your salvation. And, as we said before, it can be seared with a hot iron and defiled to such an extent that nothing you do can be acceptable to God. To the pure, everything's pure. Yeah. But if you're not pure, if you're messed up, mixed up, <clears throat> as far as your conscience is concerned, yeah. nothing you do is pleasing to God or even your mind and your conscience. Yeah. Are defined. So you've got a conscience. God gave it to you. And it's my hope and prayer that you're going to guard it. Amen. And that you're, you're not going to allow yourself to become callous, to, to sear your conscience with a hot iron. And if you don't want to get up at 6 o'clock, don't set the alarm. Uh, whatever you're telling yourself you need to do, for your own spiritual, for our own spiritual well-being, we need to follow through on those commitments. Mm -hmm. Now, as you know, our conscience uh, can be wrong. For example, Saul of Tarsus' conscience didn't bother him. He's going straight to hell. Mm -hmm. He said, I stand before God in all pure conscience, Acts 23, 1. Mm -hmm. now, I've got a theory about that, that uh, this is not a theory, this is a scripture. The law was given that every mouth might be stopped and all the world might, might become guilty, guilty before God. That was the purpose of the law. Mm -hmm. The law was given to make people feel guilty. Some churches are that way, you know. The, the, the more you worship, the worse you feel. <laughs> and that's the way Judaism was. It was designed that way by God. Mm -hmm. That there was a remembrance of sin every year. Amen. And the more you worship, the guiltier you felt. Except Saul of Tarsus and other Pharisees, the more they worship, the better they felt. I'm thankful, Lord, I'm not like that guy over there. I fast my I pay times of all. But, you know, I'm a righteous guy. I haven't done anything wrong. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, I am blameless. Now, it's my spin on this thing that the only way the Apostle Paul could have been blameless 
according to the law, as if he misunderstood the law. But somehow he had twisted and changed the law just enough so that he could come out of the things kind of like a rose. And my spin on Matthew 5, 19, I got all these scholars here, you may not agree with me, I've been wrong on so many things, I probably could be wrong on this too, but Matthew 5, 19 says, whoever will break these commandments and teach men to do so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. There are 14 different Greek words translated as break in the Bible. And this one is the one that's luo, which means to loose. So what Jesus was talking about was, I think, what Saul of Tarsus did. He did not shatter the law. He didn't go out and commit adultery and just uh, in your face re rebel against God. He didn't do that. He just changed it a little bit. I had a, an old Volkswagen uh, that uh, first week I had it, I had a flat tire. And I went to change the tire, and it had one of these kind of a Mickey Mouse wrenches. It wasn't a very good one. It was, uh, and anyhow, it was the right size wrench to put on the, the stud of the, the, the bolt on the tire to get it off. It was the right size, but it was such light metal that when you tried to put any pressure on there, it would give just a little bit. I mean, not much. Almost imperceptibly, except it wouldn't take the tire off. It gave just enough that it was useless. And this is what I think Saul of Tarsus and others did to the law of God. The law of God was designed to make you feel guilty, that every mouth might be stopped and all the world become guilty before God, and they stood before God and would cry. We're thankful, Lord, that we're not sinners. We're thankful that we keep the whole law. They didn't keep the whole law. Now, let me give you an example from the book of Leviticus that I think illustrates this point, that the law correctly understood condemns us. If you correctly understand what the law was trying to do, it was not trying to save us, it was trying to bring us to Christ that we might be justified uh, by faith. But in Leviticus chapter 5, we have some rather frightening <clears throat> aspects of the law that you could become guilty by law if you touched an unclean thing and didn't even know it. If a soul sin, Leviticus 5, 1, and hear the voice of swearing and as a witness whether he hath seen or known of it, if he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. You know of what something else that somebody did wrong. Uh, you, you're guilty if you don't uh, tell about it. Or if a soul touch any unclean thing, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast, or a carcass of an unclean cattle, or a carcass of unclean creeping things, and if it be hidden from him, he also shall be unclean and guilty. Snail was an unclean creature. Leviticus chapter 11. Could you swear on a stack of Bibles you haven't stepped on a snake in the last 24 hours? I don't know. You know. Last night it was dark, it was raining. Maybe you did. How do you know for sure? You know, you're guilty whether you know it or not. Mm -hmm. you, and I don't mean to be indiscreet, but if we were Jewish people in a Jewish context and you stepped up to the door, you are reluctant to touch it for fear that some unclean person had touched that door already. And whether you understand or not, you become unclean by touching an unclean object. Mm -hmm. You sit down in the pew, and uh, forgive me again, but if a menstruous woman had touched that pew, you become contaminated by virtue of touching your pew that she touched. There was a woman with an issue of blood in Capernaum, mm -hmm. and she was in a crowd. And she wasn't supposed to be. By law, she wasn't supposed to be in that crowd. But she was, and she pressed through the crowd and touched the hymn of Jesus Christ. Amen. You remember Amen. that story. But uh, everybody she touched by law was unclean. So that's why the, the expression, touch not, taste not, handle not, was an important concept in the Jewish religion. You just didn't take any chances. You stayed home. You didn't have any contact with people. You see a man lying by the roadside, you pass by, you went around him because you wanted to please God, didn't want to be contaminated. So we're going to assume that you're going to beat the system for one day. <coughs> you're going to fumigate the room so that there's no living thing in there, have it all cleaned out. And you're going to pull the shade so you can't see outside, you're going to stand before the law of God and you're just going to focus your mental energies 
all day long on the law of God. You're not going to sin with your mind. You're not going to touch anything. You're not going to eat anything. You're not going to drink anything. You're going to just devote yourself to God. You're going to be holy and you're going to be pure. Now, first of all, I don't think you could do that. It's amazing how even during church services, we can't focus very long on something. You know, your mind will uh, fly away to something miles away or some uh, fiery dart from the devil will bombard you intellectually. We, we couldn't focus our minds all day long, but that's just for the sake of illustration. Soon you did. You pulled it off. You were, at the end of the day, without a spot, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing according to one part of the Mosaic Law. But there was another part. Turn to chapter 4 of the book of Leviticus. And the King James Version in verse 3 is not as clear as later versions. If the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, that's King James. But it means if the, the, that the priest can sin and bring guilt on the people. Isn't that what your version reads? If you have an new, new international version or some later translation. Now, I didn't design it that way, but God did. David sinned. He was the king. Everybody in the nation had to suffer because David sinned. Yeah. And here you are. You have summoned all of your mental emotional, spiritual energies together to be pure one day and you did it only to be shot out of the town by that lousy priest. Mm -hmm. The priest sinned and made you guilty. Mm -hmm. And you throw up your hands and say, Lord, nobody can be saved by this system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's, a, that is exact, that's the point. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point of the law. The law was given that every mouth might be stopped and all the world become guilty Amen. before God. Amen. And there's something wholesome and healthy about this thing of guilt. It has dawned on me that the only way you can have life is have death and decay. It was in July 1969, Neil Armstrong put a flag on the moon. It's in perfect shape. The flag he put there over 25 years was in perfect shape. It's like an eternal deep freezer. There's no, no oxygen. It's just cold. Nothing can decay that way. It's just like it was when you planted it there. But you can't plant a garden there either. Nothing. <laughs> we'll grow. You plant a seed up there, and the seed stays the same way. There's no corrupting influence to cause that seed to grow. Jesus said, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground yeah. and die, yes. Yes. it abides alone. And unless there are spiritual forces at work in our lives that cause us to die. I would lie without the law. When the law came, sin revived, and I died. That was the best thing ever happened to me. All of a sudden, on the Damascus Road, he realized that he was, in fact, a sinner. That his righteousness was a contrived, artificial righteousness that had no real value in the eyes of God. And he came to say with David, Have mercy upon me, Amen. O God. Amen. According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. Amen. And uh, he later described himself, as you know, as the chief of sinners. Faithful saying. Here the church had sayings. This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That'd be a good saying for any church. Amen. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am, not was, or will be, I am the chief. So you got a conscience, and we want your conscience to remain tender. We don't want you to sear your conscience, violate your conscience, in any way injure this integral part of that. But what are we going to do with this thing of Saul murdering Christians or compelling them to blaspheme? Mm -hmm. Or holding the garments of those who stoned Stephen, all of the horrible skeletons in the closet of memories of his mind. What, what's going to happen to that? Now, I'm going to just give you some scriptures and pray that the Holy Spirit's going to give you wisdom and spiritual understanding. This is so far beyond me. I don't understand why when you plant a little seed, it grows. Isn't that remarkable? You take watermelon seed and plant it in the barnyard and it produces something sweet. 
I understand. I mean, that, that's a miracle. And this, my brothers and sisters, is the very essence of Christianity. It is a new creation. Amen. 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 And I've mentioned this, I think, before, but I still think it's a salient point that the, the Bible mentions poema only two times. The poeta is a Greek verb that's found over 500 times in Scripture, but the noun form of that verb, poema, is only found two times. Once it talks about physical creation, once about the spiritual. First time is Romans 1.20. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in God. He's talking about the physical creation, the sun, the moon, the stars, the galaxies, the system, the rhyme, the balance. It's like poetry. The universe, the physical universe that we're living in. And of course, the Jewish law, as you know, addressed the physical things. It, it purified mm -hmm. the flesh, mm -hmm. not the spirit, mm -hmm. not the eternal things, just fleshly things. Mm -hmm. But the only other use of this word poem, poema, it's the basis of our English word poem, is in Ephesians 2.10, where the scriptures say, we are his workmanship. That's the word. Where is poem? That somehow there is order uh, in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. He's never lost control of his body. He is the head of his body, the shepherd of the sheep, the captain of our salvation. And <clears throat> you just think about what happened in uh, the former USSR, what's happening in China, what's happening in Africa, what's happening in all the world. The head of the body is controlling the members of his body. Mm -hmm. this, this dawned on me just in the last few years. In Proverbs 6, it says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider the ways and be wise. And all I thought about for years was hard work because the ant does work hard as it lays up food for the winter. But that proverb says, She has no ruler, leader, or guide. Yeah. You don't have to send somebody out to organize an ant hill. Say, it's almost winter. Better get them ants organized. Get them lined up and start working. Get food laid up. No, you don't have to do that. Because an ant is created in a certain way that's ordinary. I mean, by, by virtue of creation, these creatures know how to do what they do. Amen. And that's the picture that we have of Christianity. It's like, Amen. It's like the metamorphosis. Amen. Caterpillar, you, Amen. If, you, if you went to Canada and started training schools for caterpillars, say, we're going to train you to get to Mexico. How are we going to? Well, you can just get south. <laughs> they never make it. <laughs> you, could have, you could have schools and teachers and systems and bureaucracy set up to train these guys. They never make it. But when a miracle happens called metamorphosis, all of a sudden those suckers come out of the cocoon with a built in navigational system and they can start. They've never been to Mexico before, but they can go to Mexico by the very route their ancestors came to Canada. This happens every year. The monarch butterfly has short lives until it gets to Canada. And when it gets to Canada, somehow God gives it enough life to get all the way back down to Southern California and Mexico in order for the species to continue. It's a miracle. It's a miracle that happens. Now that, my brothers and sisters, is what the new creation is all about. It is a miracle so that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. You have a new mind and a new conscience, I think. Amen. Amen. We're talking about the urging Amen. of the conscience. Amen. How can Saul of Tarsus have any joy in his relationship with God when he had all of these horrible skeletons in his past? All the terrible things that were haunted by us. I tell you, he turned them over to Jesus, and through the miracle of the new birth, he got a new mind. Amen. Amen. And a new conscience. And he quoted David. Now, David was not a righteous man, he was a sinner. And uh, let's just, for a little spiritual exercise, give me some of David's sins that you are aware of that are mentioned in the Scripture. He numbered the nation. He numbered the nation, and because of this, thousands of people died. It's a sin. And the Bible says his heart smote him. Doesn't use the word conscience, but his heart smote him. His heart smote him when he cut off Saul's skirt. He had a conscience. 
They just use different terminology. Go ahead. Murder. Murder. Uh, mm-hmm. he, uh, Uriah the Hittite, he had him, he had him murdered. And occasioned the death of all the servants in the, at Nob. Eighty-five priests that wore the linen effigy. And their families and their animals were all dead. Mm-hmm. Going to Edomite. Mm-hmm. And it was David's fault. And he said, I have occasioned the death of all these men in the house of God. What else? Bathsheba, adultery, but it's adultery with Bathsheba. What else? Covenant. Oh, yes, he, he was a covetous individual. At the time when kings go forth to war, he was on the rooftop lusting after Bathsheba. He was a covetous individual. He uh, he lied to Ahimelech. You know, he said, David, what are you doing? Oh, I'm on an urgent matter for the king. It's a bald faced lie. He was not on an urgent matter for the king. And he went in to the house of God and ate the showbread which it was not lawful for him to eat. David was a sinner. And he had perhaps more sins on his conscience than you have. Or than I have. But David sang a song. Psalm 32. <laughs> Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute iniquity. Amen. He used four different words to describe every kind of sin and problem that you have ever been involved in, or that I've ever been involved in. It just covers a whole gamut. Blessed is the man whose sins are covered. Now, the you've got all these Hebrew scholars here, but it's my understanding that the Hebrew word how far means to cover. The day of the Atonement is the day of the covering. Now, the word is not used in Genesis in the story of Adam and Eve sinning, but the idea of covering is there. Remember, Adam and Eve sinned and ate, for, ate forbidden fruit. I think Chuck Swindoll had this interesting insight into that. He said, you know, Adam knew that Eve was naked, but he didn't know he was because he never thought about it. So. I don't know that that's true or not, but I think it's possible. You know, how could he live with his wife and not know she was naked? <laughs> he knew that Adam was naked, she didn't know she was. Because in the ideal marriage, each mate was so focused on the other, they never thought about themselves. But when sin entered into the picture, Adam looked at himself and said, I'm naked, I'm going to go out and make a covering for myself. He said, I'm naked, I'm going to make covering for myself. And they began selfishly preparing a covering of fig leaves. The Lord said, that ain't going to work. I'll make a covering for you. And the first animal sacrifices were performed by God. And he covered them that they might come into his presence. Now that's the idea that was incorporated into Hebrew worship. Because we are covered, you know, by the propitiation. He lost there in the... In the, when the law of God was placed in the Ark of the Covenant, there were cherubim on top of those were the creatures, you know, placed at the gate of the garden to keep man from the tree of life. The cherubim. They were looking at the law of God, but they didn't see the law of God because there was a golden slab covering the law of God called the mercy seat. And that's what Jesus is. He is our covering. He is our mercy seat. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not, but if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation. He's the covering for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. John came, knelt down, looked into the tomb where Jesus was, and he saw an angel at the head and an angel at the foot Amen. of the place where Jesus had to lie, and it dawned on him we have a covering. Amen. So David said, Blessed is the man whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Yes. Amen. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute. Why well, does it say that blessed is a man who never sinned? Why not? Nobody would be blessed. 
If we say we have no sin, we make God a lie. Amen. That's right. When we get baptized into Christ, we still need an eraser on the end of our pencil. I mean, we're not going to get 100 on every test just because we got baptized. We shouldn't cancel our car insurance just because we got baptized. Baptism is seeking after a pure conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. But it doesn't mean we'll ever make a mistake any longer. We still need the grace of Christ. Amen. If we are saved by the death of Christ, we need his life even more than his death. Amen. He's right now Amen. ministering for us Amen. in the presence of God. Amen. And this, my brothers and sisters, is to me the way that our conscience can be purged by the constant ministry of Jesus. I mentioned a moment ago the tragedy of a Jewish worshiper facing the frustration of his own imperfection and the design of the law which was to create guilt. If there was, however, a time in the Jewish religious system where the people really had confidence of their relationship with God, it was on the Day of Atonement. It was on the day when the high priest entered into the Holy of Holies with blood for himself and for the errors of the people. I took several hours one day, and wrote down what happened as it is described in the 16th chapter of the book of Leviticus. This is, and I won't go through this, all but here's some legal, or some, uh, it's not, it's, I guess, uh, all these pages, both sides, one, two, three, four, five, six pages of things that I wrote down that the high priest did. He bathed, he dressed in white holy garments, he offered to present it at the door of the tabernacle of both for the sin offering uh, for himself and his house. He presented the same, uh, at the same place two goats for a sin offering for the congregation, cast lots on the goats, one to be sacrificed, one to be the scapegoat, etc., etc., etc. So he made the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and while a high priest was in the Holy of Holies, one day of the year, you felt good. You said, all right, anything I did, it's covered. And my brothers and my sisters, where is Jesus now? Amen. He's in the presence of God, ministering. Amen. 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 In our behalf. The Jewish people were doing and doing and doing and doing and doing. The Muslims do and do and do. All do this, do this, do this. The Christians focused on something which was done. One sacrifice. Amen. One sacrifice. Oh, Father, I don't understand all that I've talked about. It's too profound, too wonderful. I'm reminded of 